watch an inside out kid, which is great for kids, but also as an adult, I have to say I really enjoyed it. And if you've seen Inside Out, which is the first one, it's um, that was good. To me, Inside Out was really great too. So it's a good movie, both for kids and adults. We'll have pizza and snacks. We'll be downstairs in the hall. If you know that you are planning to go, if you can chat and tell Kate Perlat, or you can email the family ministry email just so we have a sense of pizza. But even if on Friday you realize it's a free night, still come. Don't feel like if you didn't RSVP.
Better? Yes. All right, great. Because the reason I was asking, I can get softer. It's, it's unlike me to speak loud. So if I understand this correctly, um, the goal is for me to share something meaningful to me on my journey of stewardship as we as a congregation prepare to make a similar commitment because it's an, it's an individualized process. So I wrote myself some notes because I can certainly digress and this helped me stand the target. So about two years ago, I was heading down to Fairfield for a meeting. Um, it was a beautiful day in February. I had my window open. I think I had my sunroof open a little bit too. Um, and for those who are familiar with the Merritt, um, it's to me it's certainly a much preferred ride over 91. And, um, and the trees are beautiful and I love the bridges. So I'm driving down, I'm getting in the right lane to get off, I think around Trumbull. Um, so I usually take the Route 8 down to 95. And all of a sudden, um, my, my windshield's in my lap. Um, I knew enough to, to stop. I had slowed down anyways because I was getting in the right lane. And, and I, and I, I kind of sat there for a moment, not really quite sure what happened. I knew my windshield was in my lap. My, my roof was kind of hanging on most of it in my lap and my face. And I, and I saw a few branches on me. So then I kind of figured out a tree um, or branch or something fell on me. Um, you know, clinically, I, I, when I did my clinical work, I worked in the emergency department. So I kind of had some sense on what to do. You know, I, I, it's common sense. I felt my fingers, I could move them. I felt my toes, I could move my toes. I'm thinking, all right, um, I don't have a headache. I feel okay. Um, so I figured I should call 911. I called 911. Um, I'm still sitting on the highway. Um, and they kind of walked me through, you know, um, are you bleeding? Do you seem injured? And I said, I don't think so. I feel, I feel okay. A little shaken up, you know, because I'm kind of an old man. I feel a little shaken up with this. Caught me off guard. And then the, the response was funny. They said, well, um, then we don't need to respond if you don't think you've like broken a bone or you're unconscious. And, and I said, no, I don't think so. So um, I guess like anybody would have done, I, I continued to get off the, um, the exit um, with my windshield on my lap and some branches and stuff around. And of course I had to hit a red light and I'm sitting there with my blinker on to turn left and people are kind of staring at me. And I'm thinking, I can do this, I can do this. So I pull into a gas station, I kind of get out. I kind of shake myself off a little bit. I knew I had some, you know, as your windshield smashes, it's, it's small glass. So I knew I kind of had blood and I'm doing my hair. And, um, and um, so, but I, I'm a list person. So I knew right away, I need to call my insurance company. I need to get a tow truck. Um, so I started making my calls. Um, okay, I need, to, um, I need to call the hospital to say I'm not gonna make the meeting. Um, I called them. Um, called my wife um, because um, I need to get her early because if she found out about this from someone else, the accident would have been the least of my problems. <laughs> and, um, and then I, then I called my, uh, my plan was to, to have a meeting, meet with my daughter who lives in Stanford for, for dinner, called her, left a message, won't be there. Um, then I called Shaylee, my daughter who comes to church with me because she works the closest in Farmington. And she said, I'll come pick you up. So in the meantime, um, the tow truck came, um, took my car away. Um, I, was he I was heading to my daughter's house. I had gone to BJ's before that, like a good parent. I had, you know, th big things of toilet paper and paper towels. So now I have all my belongings in front of a gas station. I'm standing there looking very disheveled and, and probably much, much older, um, with blood on me. And I'm just standing there as the cars are driving by and, um, and staring at me. But I kind of felt, okay, I'm feeling pretty good here. I got all my lists done, I have a, I have a ride going home, um, everything's, everyone's been notified, and I can kind of go home and, 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 and take care of myself. You know, so then um, Shay picks me up and we're driving, and th then, then I start thinking, I'm thinking, okay, um, this branch or tree fell on me. I still don't quite know what it was, because I, I knew enough not to get out of my vehicle, so I, I, I'm not sure what was on the road when I left. And I, and I said, geez, you know, Oh, in the last in the last month, 
I knew of two separate car accidents with, that involved three people um, where a branch or a tree had fallen on them. I'm thinking, okay, I knew that two out of three of those people had perished. So now I'm thinking, all right, all right, all right, this is more serious than I thought. So then I started thinking, oh my gosh, I could have died. So now I went through, I did my safety checklist, but the accident, now I started going through my life checklist, thinking, hmm, if I would have died right now, what would happen to me? And I'm gonna tell you, I was really shocked at where I ended up. Because I'm thinking at my age, I figured I kind of nailed this religion thing by now. You know, I've been, I've been a Lutheran my whole life, going to church all the time, doing all the right things, saying the right stuff. And I realized I'm not where I should be. I've taken a very passive role in my religion. Um, I do the right things, but you know, life is funny. It, it, it provides us organic benchmarks to measure ourselves. And we can almost, you know, if there was a transparency, so I started sitting there thinking, okay, so what was my, what was my faith like when I was 63? What was it like when I was 60? What was it like when I was 50? And I'm thinking, gosh, the past 20 or 30 years, it really hasn't changed much. I'm really doing the same things now that I did 20, 30, 40 years ago. Um, so now I really started getting worried. And, you know, um, I go home and, you know, life goes on. And for the next couple of weeks, I got to tell you, this, um, this was ever present in my mind, thinking, how did I end up in this point with my religion? I've done all the right stuff. You know, I brought my kids to church, um, put, a, put the Bible in their hand in church, all those right things. Um, I help people as, 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 a, as a profession. And I'm thinking, I'm, I'm far from where I should be. So then I realized, you know, again, being a list person, what's my list? What am I going to do? So I really started doing my research, and I realized that I've, I've always looked at spirituality, as Webster defines it, as a noun. And I said, my first thought is, I have to make this a verb for me. This needs to be an action item for me. Because making my spirituality a noun hasn't got me where I, where I know I need to be. So that was, that was certainly a mental change for me. Uh, how do I make this an action item? Um, and then I started thinking, all right, now what am I gonna do? What am I gonna do? And how do I get here? Again, you know, you get these epiphanies in your life and I realized that um, it's not the, I was always shooting for the end game, but what's really important are the steps that I take in my religion every single day. You know, that, that old expression, you know, it's, it's, um, it's progress, not perfection. Um, I haven't made the progress that I thought that, again, I, I should have nailed religion at my age, and I haven't, because I hadn't taken the steps that I needed to take as, as my life went on. So then I started thinking, okay, what do I need to do, what do I need to do? So I started my list, and I brought an abbreviated list here, because um, to keep me, just to talk about some highlights, but my list, my list literally at home is a couple page list. Um, you know, first I said, let, let me, let me, um, I'm in the people business. Let me start by seeing people. Am I seeing people? I worked in the emergency department, you know, again, for 20 years of my career. And there you learn not to make eye contact with people because they're in the ED for so many hours. If you make eye contact, you're going to say to me, how much longer am I going to be here for? So you learn not to make eye contact, you know, back then we had, um, we had clipboards, so you have to kind of look at those as you walk through. I had, I made a conscious effort, it's number one on my list, to start seeing people. Seeing who they are, where they're at, what their needs are, and not judging people. It's hard for me not to do that. Again, working in the emergency department, you judge, you make decisions, you move people through, uh, you make dispositions. It was really, I, I really struggled with that piece. Um, I, have to, I have to say to myself, look, don't judge. Make me eye contact. Um, COVID was perfect for me because I had a mask on. Um, and um, it really helped me limit my interactions with people. Um, and I didn't realize for years, I, I would smile to people, probably a year in the COVID, I'd say, oh my God, I'm still smiling to people, but I have a mask on, no one's seeing it. Um, so again, it's that human connection. It's that... Religion to me is all about relationships, especially being Lutheran. It's our community. And I realized that I had these barriers set up. 
um, speaking. You know that old adage, sticks and stones. Well, we all learned that was wrong. Words do hurt. So with intention, um, it's important for me to choose the right words as, as I see people and, and talk to them. Um, I'm towards the end of my career, and I certainly have made a priority to um, teach, coach, and mentor new healthcare leaders in our organizations. Um, how do we help them? How do we give them the tools? So I'm thinking this is something after, you know, about 40 years in the field, things that I can contribute, and I can help make change. I wrote down picking up trash in the community. I haven't done that yet, but I figured if I wrote it down here, um, I'll do it. So that, that's more for myself. But there are other changes that I also needed to make. When the pastor mentioned joining the council, never been on a council in my life at a church. Um, I knew I had to say yes. Um, this is, although this is really for the church community, I said yes, to be honest with you, for me. I need to do this. It's important to me to participate and help others grow. Um, I recently have joined the board of directors uh, for a nonprofit legislative group. Um, my field is, is mental health and um, to, to help lobby and, and act and, and create mental health services for children in the state of Connecticut, throughout all parts of Connecticut. Um, I feel there's another area I can, I can make change on. Um, one of my biggest changes was my church contribution. There's so many ways of paying um, our contributions to the church nowadays. Um, I still like putting money in an envelope. And what's real important to me is quite, a, you know, for example, I have two today. I go through the process each week. I know that we can pay it like a month, and this just this works for me. And so you could, you know, like um, Shaylee, you know, sometimes she'll pay, if she'll pay more at one time. Um, I like doing it weekly. It's really important for me to do this every single week. I, you know, I don't go to the bank anymore. I go to the ATM, and I get out money, and I put it in my envelope. And, and often during the week, I'll make two or three trips to get the money out. So I don't want it to be a one and done. This makes me think about my contributions to the church and what those contributions mean. And I think by doing that, I found other list pieces that I could add to my list. One was, I'm, 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 I've been so good about, I do all my envelopes. By the end of the year, I am all caught up. I've submitted every single envelope and I feel real good about myself. And that's the money that we do for, for our synod, for the community. But I realized, again, I'm missing the obvious. Often, there's a grocery store close to the hospital I work out. And, and periodically, I'll go to the grocery store. And um, most days, there's someone standing there um, hoping that someone's going to share some money. And often, I, um, I, if, I hit, if I'm the first one there, I, I, I hit the, he the uh, headlight. And if he's standing there, I'll keep my car back here so that I don't make eye contact with them. Um, or I'll think, oh, thank goodness, I gotta I'm taking a right versus a left. So as I, as, I, as I go through my journey, realizing that contributions are important to the church, I now started keeping money um, in my, over my visor. Um, and um, so I can give someone some money because uh, cause even it, to me, it's more than just giving the money. It's, it's part of my initial list, too, to see people, not to judge people. Um, I don't care what we need the money for. Who knows what I'd be doing if I was in that situation. Um, you know, so my journey um, from my accent certainly grew, um, took on a big part of my life, but it's helping me focus on what I do every single day. And for me, um, the biggest impact is my con I look at my contributions. I know we're supposed to talk about stewardship, so I got I got to put this in there. Um, this works for me because I see my money do things. I also know that by doing this reminds me that I can put some money towards that person I see at that red light at, at any place, and I can contribute to them in the moment um, and have an immediate impact. So that's kind of my story, and I, I think the intent was, again, for me to talk about a meaningful experience. Hopefully you can share into it. Hopefully it touches in some way. Um, but I've certainly learned that when I look at our stu my stewardship, 
it's very, very different for me. So thank you for your time. Um, and allow me to come. The first reading is from Amos, chapter 5. Seek the Lord and live, or he will break out against the house of Joseph like fire, and it will devour Bethel, with no one to quench it. I, you that turn justice to wormwood and bring righteousness to the ground. They hate the one who reproves in the gate, and they abhor the one who speaks the truth. Therefore, because you trample on the poor and take them take from them le levies of grain. You have built houses of hewn stone, but you shall not live in them. You have planted pleasant vineyards, but you shall not drink their wine. For I know how many are your transgressions and how great are your sins. You who afflict the righteous, who take a bribe and push aside the needy in the gate. Therefore, the prudent will keep silent in such a time, for it is an evil time. Seek good and not evil, that you may live, and so the Lord, the God of hosts, will be with you, just as you have said. Hate evil and love good, and establish justice in the gate. It may be that the Lord, the God of hosts, will be gracious to the remnant of Joseph. The word of the Lord. The second reading is from Hebrews chapter 4. Indeed, the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing until it divides soul from spirit, joints from marrow. It is able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. And before him, no creature is hidden, but all are naked and laid bare to the eyes of the one to whom we must render an account. Since then, we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast to our confession, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weakness, but we have one who in every respect has been tested as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore approach the throne of grace with boldness, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. The word of the Lord.
than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. They were greatly astounded and said to one another, Then who can be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, For mortals it is impossible, but not for God. For God all things are possible. Peter began to say to him, Look, we have left everything and followed you. Jesus said, Truly I tell you, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or fields for my sake and for the sake of the good news, who will not receive a hundredfold now in this age, houses, brothers and sisters, mothers and children and fields with persecution, and in the age to come, eternal life. But many who are first will be last, and the last will be first.
to your aunt to visit? No? Oh, your mom
to say this, I don't think this is one we can create an excuse to make our way out of. I think this message is for me. I also suspect that it's for you too. And so, in order for us to really think about it, what exactly is Jesus asking both of us and from us in this story? Does Jesus literally mean that each of us should go home today, sell everything, give all the money to the poor, and have absolutely nothing? I don't think that is what Jesus intended. And I think to begin to answer that, we have to remember where Jesus is heading. Jesus is heading to Jerusalem. Jesus is heading towards the cross, and Jesus is beginning to foretell to his disciples what is going to happen to him. That Jesus is going to die for the poor and for the rich, for all of us on the cross. And so, I think that instead, Jesus is calling us to realize that all that we have, all of our possessions, all of our money is actually God's, not ours. Perhaps that's what Jesus is trying to get the rich man in our gospel reading and us to really understand and to embody. So what does that mean for us, that everything we have is actually God's? Does it mean that if we don't sell everything or are as generous as we would like to be, that we need to worry about eternal life? Again, our gospel reading has something about that, too. Because it says that all things are possible with God. Because if we could save ourselves, we wouldn't need Jesus, either. And so instead of thinking about what's required of us to get this eternal reward of eternal life, I think this reading is instead calling us to the characteristics that are needed to live a life of a Christian. This idea of servanthood and sacrifice isn't new in the story of Jesus. Who can tell me the two commandments that Jesus says we're the top two? There you go, Kathy. Love God and love your neighbor. That's right. And Jesus doesn't make distinctions on who your neighbor is. Our neighbor is a woman who's out of work and is in need of state assistance and assistance from nonprofits to be able to put food on her family's table. Our neighbor is Taylor Swift, too, and Jeff Bezos, the ones whose wealth feels so far out of reach for us that we can't even yet imagine it. Our neighbors are Republicans, and our neighbors are Democrats, too. Our neighbors are Christians and others who have a faith tradition that is different from ours and those who have no faith tradition either. Everyone is our neighbor, which means we are called to care for, to love, and to look with compassion as best as we can. Not because, as Tom said, we're reaching our list to try to get to eternal life, but because it's the character and the calling of being a Christian. It's an almost impossible standard for us to do this all the time, but I think Jesus is also telling us that if we share, there is in fact enough for all. And so we confess the hold that money has on us and on our communities too. We confess that we don't always make sure that everyone has enough. We confess that we do hoard our resources, and we also spend our money on things that really don't matter. But also, I think this gospel reading calls us to be willing to sit in the midst of the hard truth. That we pray that our, the Spirit breaks our heart open to see our neighbors and to see what they are telling us, no matter how hard it is to hear. And that Awareness and confession is also a part of being a follower of Jesus. I think Jesus looks on, with compassion on each and every one of us, too, knowing that this is not easy. 
knowing how anxious uncertainty makes all of us, knowing how hearing hard truth can make us feel ashamed, so ashamed that we close ourselves off to what we're hearing. But Jesus' love will always surround us, no matter who we are or what we experience. That sacrificial love that Jesus gives on the cross is for each and every one of us. So when we don't get it right, we confess, and we hear the words of love and forgiveness from our Savior. Let us pray. Challenged by God's word in Christ, let us pray for the church, the world, and the whole creation. Compassionate God, embolden the church to seek all who are lost. Clothe those who are naked and mend what is broken. We especially pray for those who are in the path of Hurricane Milton. God of grace, <laughs> steadfast God, inspire world leaders to share resources and work collectively to end global poverty, starvation, and preventable disease. Direct us to seek justice and equity that all may live in peace. God of grace, <laughs> loving God, we pray for those who are afflicted, tormented, grieving, oppressed, and lonely. Deliver the strength of your love and compassion to all who need it today. God of grace. Generous God, we give thanks for the First Nations and tribes who inhabited this land. We lament the harm done by colonization. Call us to deeper appreciation and care for the languages, rituals, and history of all indigenous people. God of grace, 
ever-living God, we rejoice to be heirs of the eternal life made real in Jesus' death and resurrection. We give thanks for saints of all times and places, first and last, who still inspire us to faithful living. God of grace. Into your hands, O God, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in the saving grace you freely give, both now and forever.
in the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread. He gave thanks and he broke it. And he gave it to the disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this in remembrance of me. Remembering, therefore, his death, resurrection, and ascension, we await his coming in glory. Pour out upon us the spirit of your love, O Lord, and unite the wills of all who share this heavenly food, the body and blood of Jesus Christ our Lord, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be all honor and glory, now and forever. Amen. Let us pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done.
Holy God, you have welcomed us to this meal and fed us with dignity at your table. Send us now to welcome others and to be at peace with one another. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.